Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Well, and I'm Anna Chen. I'm the bus ambassador. I'm also a councillor for Manningham. And uh, I'm going to host a very important session that is the ZEP, Zero Emission Buses. And uh, min the minister, just like minister has touched on in her opening remarks, she spent quite some time in introducing uh, ZEPs. That is why we all know that that is really, really important topics. So allow me to introduce our following guest speakers. That is Andy Cole, who will be the guest speaker for this very, very important topic. And Andy Cole is a well known to many in this room. He has had a long career in the public sector, first in local government before moving to the state sector. He spent a decade in local government in sustainable transport roles, including a stint as NTF secretary. He then moved to roles in the state government, including ministerial advisor, member of Sir Rod Editor's East West Link team, which kicked uh, started the big build with regional rail link and metro tunnel projects, train, train, and bus planner. Now Andy is in commercial advisory in DTP, leading the ZEP trials and transition. Let's give a big round pause to Andy Cole. Thank you. This is Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Apologies for the photo. That's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> um, and to start off, I think this is my first in real life presentation I've done for about three years. It's all been on screen, so uh, uh, I might be a bit rusty. Apologies. So, zero emission bus trials. If I go to the next slide, which is that button there. Thank you. We were incredibly fortunate to receive $20 million from the government through the zero emission, sorry, zero emission vehicles roadmap to actually run a ZEB, oh, a ZEB trial. Um, and that's great for government, for industry, for all of us, because rarely do you actually get the ability to test something first before we have to do it. So great foresight from the government to actually provide that funding to really go out and engage with operators, industry, um, charger manufacturers, and it was really building that coalition of people that know that by 2025, we've got to change the way we do business in bus world. No longer will we be filling up with diesel, spilling diesel all over the place, greasy mechanics wandering around um, looking after the joints and the likes. It's a whole new world after 2025. So, all new buses purchased from 2025, the government has committed, will be zero emission buses, which is an enormous leap forward. This trial will support and inform the government's commitment of what I just said, sorry, I'm rusty, and the ZEB consultation paper, which we had released, and the consultations have just closed, um, proposed DTF's approach to that transition. We've had some terrific feedback on that. Thank you. And right now we're going through digesting that feedback, adjusting our, um, our approach really to the um, transition plan. And we should have that transition plan out by mid next year, but we may well have to do a little bit of con extra consultation on our way on some topics. A bit of context and overview. It's a big network, the bus network. And we've got an enormous range of small, urban and regional operators. We've got operators that run a third of the metro network. We've got operators that are just mum and dad who've got a, bus or, a school bus or two out in the paddock in regional Victoria. All of them will be transitioning from 2025. So somehow we've got to come up with a plan that not only looks after the big operators who are very savvy, incredibly professional, but we've also got to look after you know, a dairy farmer who's got two buses and runs them for schools every day. How do we help them transition away from something they know, diesel-powered buses, which you know, they use to fill up their tractors and the likes, to a whole new world? Different contracts for different types of services. I mentioned school buses. We've got uh, regional buses. We've got metro buses. Um, we've got the V-Line buses. There's an awful lot of buses out there that are both contracted and tendered. 
Um, and most of the buses and depots are privately owned. Government doesn't own the buses. We don't buy the buses ourselves. Essentially, there's a lease agreement whereby the operators will buy the bus, the uh, state pays for that lease of that bus for 18 years, and after 18 years, um, we no longer pay. The operator can do as they like. So essentially, the operators provide all of us a, a bus service as a service, and government pays for that service. Local content requirements. Right now, our local content requirements for zero emission buses at Metro Fleet is around 60%. It's fairly hard to achieve. It's a good stretch for local industry. We've got a great local operator down in Dandenong being Volgren, and there are plenty of other bus operators from around Australia who want to move to Victoria and Invest Victoria are dealing with those proposals. So moving to ZEBS is a great opportunity both to provide a bit of competition in the market and to really solidify, as the Minister was saying, manufacturing in Victoria. Um, and of course the bus plan itself is introducing further reforms, as the Minister was saying, about um, the broader bus network. National collaboration, <coughs> excuse me, we're not doing this by ourselves. New South Wales, Queensland and all the other um, states around Australia are also going through this transition to zero emission buses. Um, and we are sharing what we know. That's the best thing about it. The trial's fantastic because all the operators are talking to each other, manufacturers are talking to each other, and the states are talking to each other. So they're particularly Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, understandably we've got the biggest bus fleets, we're all standardising our requirements, we're sharing what we know, and we really want to try and achieve interoperability between the bus fleets because ideally the gold standard is what we have right now with diesels. You pull up to a diesel pump, you fill the bus up, off you go. If we can do that again with electricity, we're there. But the real challenge is different plugs, different software that run the different buses. We've got to get the interoperability and the standards right. Hopefully we will. Why are we transitioning to ZEBS? Oh, sorry. Um, basically because it's a really, really good thing to do and everybody else is doing. The operating cost is much lower than running diesels. The capital cost of particularly the depot upgrades is a lot more, however it pays back over time. The Minister mentioned the transport sector emits about 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions and the ZEB transition supports the government's target of net zero by 2045. In Europe, as an example, there's over 5,000 electric buses out there running around and about 150 hydrogen buses. In the transition plan, we talk about how the state itself is technology agnostic, as in battery electric or hydrogen buses. We absolutely are. However, we've got to acknowledge battery electric buses are off that bleeding edge technology. Hydrogen's still there. It's probably five to seven years away. So the door is absolutely open for hydrogen buses. We're trialling two hydrogen buses, which hopefully will hit the road at the West Footscray Depot in the next couple of weeks. However, they are a lot more expensive than battery electric buses, and right now battery electric buses can do everything we want them to do. But we don't want to get stuck in the hole, if you're old as I am, the VHS beta situation, like putting all our money into the wrong technology in the longer term. So that's why we're open to both. We'll see where industry leads us. The ZEB trials, Minister mentioned again, they are underway. They've been really, really good because it's about industry engagement. That's what it was all about. We knew battery electric works and we've got operators, manufacturers and um, electricity providers all talking to each other. The surprising thing for me when we were running the trials was that bus operators themselves, they're pretty competitive because they all compete amongst each other for the contracts the government puts out to run there. We didn't think they'd talk to each other as much as they have or cooperate as much as they have. But it's been fantastic. It's been quite an eye-opener. They're learning a lot. We're learning a lot. Um, you can see the numbers there. I won't go through them. Um, but we're going to have 89 ZEBs in operation by middle of next year, which is pretty exciting for us, I think. Um, key learning so far, zero, the battery electric buses are delivering the services that are out there right now. They run on time. They do the distance. There is no range anxiety. Um, the BEBs right now that are out there, from all the depots we run them out of, can do what the diesel can do in its daily run, and they come back with about 40% still in their tank. 
um, you know, relatively speaking, whatever electrons are measured by. Um, so there's plenty of reserve in them to do the distance. And that's in the first generation batteries that we've got right now. Second generation batteries are going to be lighter, smaller again. So the technology is evolving rapidly. We're lucky to be here. The main challenge really is the depots, getting the power to the depots and upgrading the depots. And that's where local government can really help us, and I'll talk about that a bit later. There's long lead times for the power upgrades, and we have had in the trial some issues with the bus charger interface. Basically, the charger talking to the bus, or it doesn't. And we're working through with the uh, charger manufacturers to resolve most of that. Most of it is resolved, but um, we're getting there. And I mentioned before, higher capital costs, but operational costs are a lot lower for the um, battery electric buses. Objectives. Oh, look, these are your standard objectives you see in your council plan. We've all got objectives. They're good for everybody. Um, Maximising benefits, flexibility to embrace technology innovation. That's why we're saying we're technology agnostic. Transitioning efficiently and effectively, so greater value for money. It's the only way we're going to get money out of Treasury to help this transition. Whole of network approach, so the buses have to do the distance. They have to provide the service that we're asking um, the operators to do, and they are so far. Working with operators and industry, and that's been a great highlight for me. Everyone's been incredibly cooperative and great to work with and supporting current and future operating requirements. That's, you know, when we change a bus route, get a bus route working better, the ZEBs have got to be able to do that sort of work. Um, consultation paper. The purpose of it really was, to, you know, to lay out what DTP, what me and my team thought were the challenges and opportunities the response so far has been really positive. I'm wrapped about that. And it's also been very thoughtful, which is uh, great. You know, I've lived through council and everything else, and sometimes some of the submissions, you go, my God, why did you bother writing it? But um, a lot of submissions we've got have been really insightful, well thought through, and really good. Over, this, over 70 submissions, including the MTF submission. So thank you for that. They've been great. We're going through them now. So it's going to take a while. Feedback we sought, development of ZEB standards and specifications. I spoke earlier that we're working with the East Coast states to get those sands and specs together. New South Wales have got thousands of specifications for buses. That's basically because they had a whole lot of rail planners write them for them, so they're really specific. Queensland's a little less. We've really gone for outcome oriented specifications and it looks like the other two states are coming back towards that outcome oriented specs. And that's not, outcome oriented specs is more like it should be able to do this rather than you will use these parts to achieve this outcome. So I think that's a good way to go and everybody seems to be agreeing with that. Supporting the workforce transition, the training and skills. Right now, the original manufacturers are providing most of the training. The Volgrens, the Volvos, the Scanias are training up the mechanics at the different depots. We've got Kangit Institute down at Docklands. They've put on a course now for um, bus operators and bus technicians. We're slowly getting that up to speed. However, right now, most of the diesel buses, the manufacturers, they actually don't want the depot stuff touching the engine anyway. That's contracted out to start with. So a lot of the electrical components won't need, you know, on depot um, expertise to look after it. It's generally going around checking the tyres, checking the interior, doing frame inspections and the likes. So the training for the mechanics isn't that different to what's happening right now. Commercial arrangements. Funding and financing, that's always a tricky bit. We're working our way through that with the operators. Fleet replacement, flexibility and availability. Currently every year, um, I said the lifespan of a bus is about 18 years. So after that 18 years, it's the fleet goes into the fleet replacement program where the operator will come back to us and say, look, that bus is 18 years old, we need to buy a new one. Going by your specifications, how about we buy this one and we'll approve or not. Um, so we do about 250 buses a year on the, in, on the fleet replacement program. So that's the pipeline for the manufacturers out there. About 90 of them are coaches or school bus um, fleet. Sequencing of depot upgrades. 
that's going to be hard. So it's easy with large operators who've got a, you know four or five depots because they could do a depot at a time and cascade their fleet to de different depots as they do that specific depot. We've got to work that through and get a bit more specific on how we might be able to do regional and rural depots. That's a little bit harder, but it's doable, and we're working with the BAV on that. Depot master planning, same sort of thing. It's hard. It's not easy. Again, energy grid upgrades. We're working with the Department of Environment, um, Energy, and other acronym, and um, the DNSPs, which are the electricity providers, to try and cut work out what the best way is to engage with them so we can get our depot upgrades done in a timely manner. Construction market market capability and capacity. Again, it's about the depots getting the right contractors in there at the right time to be able to finish the works in a reasonable and cost-efficient manner. And what well, any other potential opportunities and innovations you might well have out there we're interested in. These are the questions most people ask and the myths we you know, people weren't sure about. Will there be industry capacity to um, look after the ZEBs? Absolutely. Industry's clamouring to get involved. They're really keen. Um, the local content requirement in Victoria is being looked at and there's interest from Queensland and New South Wales in having the same sort of level of local content. Um, Volgren out in Dandenong can do these volumes and there's other people interested in moving to Victoria. So the issue of... Will there be enough ZEBs to be built? I think we can rest assured the buses aren't a problem. The depots are going to be hard. Will we consider hydrogen too? Absolutely. We're trialling two hydrogen buses. Um, they're just not as mature as battery electric right now. It's just not there. However, in eight to ten years, it could flip and it could be really cheap and effective to run a hydrogen bus. We just don't know. So the door's wide open. What about small and regional operators? Absolutely difficult, but not that difficult. And we're going to have another round of consultation with regional and rural operators in the next couple of weeks. We'll go out to, I think we're thinking of Colac, Shepparton and Morwell um, and work with the BAV on that. But don't tell the BAV yet because I haven't run Chris. Um, local content, just Victoria? No, it's actually Australia and New Zealand. There was a bit of a preconception that local content was just Victoria. Great for Volgren, but it really is Australia and New Zealand. And what about what are we doing about training mechanics? I mentioned that just previously, TAFE courses and the manufacturers right now are doing the training. Please interrupt at any time if you have questions. Works much better that way for me. Ah. Oh. Transition providing opportunities for manufacturing, absolutely, really important. I think there's great opportunities for local manufacturers and engineering. And I didn't even know there was green collar capabilities. Like, this is a new thing for me, green collar, white collar. But it's really big and there's a lot of small to medium companies who are moving to Victoria. Please. Uh, the, current, the, the current batteries, how long do they last? Great. Absolutely no. Fantastic question. Currently, the bus batteries last about ten years. Am I going over time? Am I? Oh, no, I'm just oh. <laughs> please carry on. I'll start. Currently, the buses bus batteries last about ten years, from what we can tell. Even in the UK, there's only one set of bus batteries which are coming towards the end the end of their life. However, there's an enormous second life for batteries. So saying they only last 10 years means they come down in their capacity, they can only do 80% of what they used to do, which means they can't run a, you know, a bus route any more reliably, so run out of juice, basically. So we take them out after 10 years, and there's a couple of companies, um, some are talking about moving to Victoria, that do the second life refurbishment for batteries, and they make really good static batteries for homes, for factories and everything else. So you can get another life out of that 80% volume in that existing battery. And potentially after that 80 goes down to 60, the batteries can be taken away, refurbished and used again. So there is a refurbishment half-life, I guess. And we do it right now with diesel engines. They get a half-life refurb. Um, but with the batteries, there's another life for those batteries too and the technology is rapidly changing. Thanks.
Yeah, um, you were saying that they were saying that the life of a, an average bus is 18, 18 years. years. That's right. So what happens to that bus once the battery reaches 10 years? What happens to the We put a new set of batteries in those buses, absolutely, and they keep going to that for their 18 years. So, the, yeah, it's a recharge. Yep. Um, depot construction and capital works. There's over 100 bus depots around Victoria, all of various sizes, from, you know, one or two buses up to, I think the biggest one's about 120 buses. Most will require a level of upgrade, and that's the challenge we've got right now, what level of upgrade they will need. This is the money slide for you guys. John? Is that, yeah, that's great. Um, I know that in other states are moving towards bringing depots back into public ownership in some way. Is that something that you're doing here in Victoria? There's sort of some movement around it, but the gov government's really got a view whether it, what is the value for the state to own the depot. Basically, the value for the state to own the depot is to foster competition at the end of the contract term. So that's a whole other project outside of my, you know, I'm not doing it. However, for regional and rural, you tend to wonder, is there any real benefit in owning a two-bus depot out there somewhere? However, in metro areas, perhaps there is, because at the end of the contract term, the, um, all the bidders can bid on one particular asset amongst themselves rather than something that's owned by somebody else. A thorny question, um, but yeah, swings and roundabouts. Uh, uh, Amanda, sorry, please yep. use the mic. Oh, yeah, sure, sorry. Yeah, um, I had another question on, on the access accessibility about um, Ambassador on the MTF, and uh, I noticed that uh, the with the the Zebs, there'll be no noise. So right. how do we make this, um, you know, so we don't have a little old lady, you know, going across the street and being knocked over? Absolutely. And we've had uh, New South Wales, Queensland and ourselves have had discussions about that. There is a sound that kicks in at about 20 kilometres an hour. Um, the one I saw in Timboon just the other day was a low-level growl. It sounded like a bit of a V8 or something coming down the road. But basically an artificial noise that kicks in at a low speed so pedestrians are aware it's around. There's different levels of that noise. There's arguments about amongst some people on whether you need the noise or not or what level of noise and how, in, in, how that interrupts local environment like we're talking here. Um, but... It's absolutely something we have to do and is on the buses right now. What's in it for local government? Um, quieter, healthy local streets and activity centres is really the bottom line. I was going to use Queensbridge Street as an example. That was a response we got to the consultation paper. A couple of residents in North Melbourne wrote in to us saying the bus route 401, which had been diverted out of Queensbridge Street due to the Melbourne Metro Works, was a nightmare for them. They hated it. And, you know, the submission started like that, and I thought, oh, God, here we go. But then they said... We've started getting electric buses on that route run by transit and they're fantastic we really like them the you know we're not we're actually welcoming them that's terrific so it was one of those great corros you read starts badly and it got really quite good so the local community are welcoming their bus these sort of buses in their streets because they are quiet they're unobtrusive they and you can see some of the uh, comments we've had from uh, Passengers, I love that one in blue, it's just hilarious. You can imagine what age group that was written by. How can local governments help in the ZEB transition? Really, it's all about the approvals. Um, we've done a couple of, we've done one whole depot upgrade and a couple of mini depot upgrades around uh, Metro Melbourne, part of the ZEB trials. And our challenging bits engaging with local government really was getting the per building and planning permits, general staff availability within the local governments and the coordination amongst that. So it's something we've got to work close to you, with you guys, in building that those links, knowing who to talk to, not dissimilar to the power operators too, the DNSPs, knowing where the front door is and who we speak to, and if they're not there, who else can we speak to to get these building approvals and get these depot upgrades happening in a timely manner? 
Um, next steps for us, we are going through the um, feedback to the consultation paper. I've just finished a brief to the Minister. Hopefully she'll get that in the next couple of days. A couple of more targeted workshops and we're expecting you to get the ZEB transition paper should be available from mid-2024. Any questions, please? Thank you, Andy. Let's give Andy a round big applause. Well, no doubt that the transition to ZEB will help tackle climate change. And it is also an opportunity to, uh, to change our bus networks and to create a positive image of buses. So as Andy have mentioned that the main challenges are depot. So MTF, uh, we have 26 uh, council members representing over 4 million uh, Burnians in Victoria. So we look forward to working with you for a smooth uh, depot transition. So um, I believe that there are many, many questions for Andy because ZEP is a very big thing. Uh, I just wonder, uh, I just opened the floor to, for questions. Before I start, I just kicked off with a question. All right. Andy, uh, if you are ne renegotiating bus service contracts, what single metric would you add? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, a great question. Without doubt, one thing I've got to consider to get Treasury outside is value for money for the existing services we are providing, because that's what the contracts are all about, a continuation on services. But the one thing we have to provide is a flexibility within the contract to take on bus reforms. Because during a seven to 10 year contract, there will be bus reforms that happen, that go on, you know, we'll straighten a route out, get uh, more frequency along the route, but the contract has got to be flexible enough to actually take that on, charge appropriately, appropriately for that increased level of service or change of service. So we've got to be very tight about the contracts being flexible enough to take the evolution of the bus network. Uh, so, yeah, so I've yeah. got a question um, from Simon you. Stainsby that's come in on Slido. Um, and those of you who are in the room, you can use Slido as well. The code is MTFBUS3. I've got that right, Greg? Yes, so please use that. So I'll read out this question. It's on the board. Thank you, Brad. Sorry, I can't read behind me. Um, so Simon's question um, is, is there a role for end-of-route top-up charge points? Because if so, there are some urban design questions about what they might look like. Thanks, Jane. Um, there may well be. Again, we're not closing the door on them. Currently, there is one already in the trials on the C CDC run the Monash Uni shuttle from Huntingdale Station to Monash Uni, and we've got a rapid charger at Monash Uni right now that the driver plugs in during his break. So it's out there right now, we're trialling it. However, with the way batteries are going, they're covering the distance we need with only needing top-ups at night at the depots. So we're not sure, doors wide open, and I completely acknowledge the urban design questions that might be around, like what will it look like? Um, we've got to wait and see. Can you repeat the question? Because I'm not sure if the gentleman's microphone is on. And I understand the question as being um, a lot of the buses have got different internal designs. The Mikeys are in different places. They've got passenger announcements that happen and sometimes they don't happen. And the passenger information displays work on some and they don't. Um, best way I could frame that is the buses live for 18 years. So you may well be on a bus that's 
10 years old or so. However, when I was speaking about the specification and standards we're working with Queensland and New South Wales, that would be absolutely part of those specs and standards on where you know, the card reader should be, what level of passenger information displays should be there, the wheelchair restraint system, how the buses should lean down to make accessibility happen. Um, so that's part of the standards. I can't honestly put my hand on heart and tell you why they're not happening now. Sorry. Um, I thought the Queensbury Street example was really interesting and as a City of Melbourne officer I was really <laughs> excited to hear it. Um, is that something that you're finding with other routes when more electric buses are getting deployed on them that there's strong passenger feedback? As a regular bus user I feel great when I'm on an electric bus but is the wider community feedback, is that something that you're hearing more and more from people who even don't use buses that that's quieter on their street or something like that? Anecdotally, absolutely. Um, haven't got a whole lot of written responses on that, but even the buses I've caught in Northcote and the likes, people hop on them, they're smiling, they engage with the driver, and we know from Kinetic, who run quite a few battery electric buses, that their absentee rate for the drivers who drive the buses is statistically lower than it is for the diesels. And they're telling us, like, some of the older drivers are actually gaming the younger drivers to get on the battery electric bus because it's a smoother, more comfortable drive, much easier on them for, you know, eight hours behind the wheel and the likes. So without doubt there's those unintended consequences, such as the drivers love them too, um, and from an urban design and, you know, being in a space, they're much better than a diesel, really. But, um, yeah, I haven't got a whole lot... You know, of solid evidence that people love them, but they seem to. Hey, Tom. Uh, Tom Mellican from Manuel, great to see you again. Um, the picture you showed was a bus in, in Brisbane, which is distinctly different to ours. It looks, seems to me that the buses we are rolling out look very similar to the older style buses. Is there any thought to actually making the whole, the new fleet look so totally different or a different? colour or something to really highlight the fact that they are electric? Um, I don't know if I can go back. No, I can't go back. There's actually some graphics on the back of the buses that show that they're... Um, I've got clear. There's graphics on the back, back of the buses that actually so, show that they're a little, um, green buses. It's like the bit on the back with the flowers and I'm a 100% electric bus and on the back window it's all electric. So it's a PT the livery, however, with a few uh, plants all over it is the look right now for zero emission buses. As far as the general body looking different, I doubt it. Honestly, the manufacturers are basically using the same body. It's the chassis itself that is different for a battery electric bus. You know, the engine, the battery pack, the wheels, uh, driver's seat. They're amazing when you go out to the factory and see it. Like, it's just this virtually a skateboard, and then they put the body on top of it and then they wrap the body in that livery. So the different look really is just those flowers and the likes and the writing on them that I'm 100% electric bus. However, people really do notice it as soon as they step on board. I'll Thanks, Andy. Uh, Knowles from Movement and Place Consulting, for those online. Um, thinking about the growth areas that we've got, and the Minister talked about a lot of growth occurring in Melbourne, and um, we, we know that there's a you know, role of intensification in the city um, and in the existing areas. But when we get to those fringe areas, uh, what, what lessons have you picked up from some of the recent research um, with bus routes that we've seen you know, go in place right when the first houses are being put into subdivisions? And how is that playing into the work you're, you're doing to make sure that we not only get the investment in you know, changing the technology, but also making sure we've got new growth areas where the people are, are supported from day one in those areas. Absolutely understand where you're getting to, like that GAIC funding for the local areas and stuff. 
Unfortunately, I'm going to have to be a classic public servant and handball that to bus planning and George's team because they are in the bus plan, they are absolutely looking after that and addressing that. Part of that is that review of flexi ride services. Personally, I'm a fan of flexi ride, however, you know, it doesn't work in all places all the time. Um, there's got to be different approaches for bespoke different areas. And I think you're spot on. Gate funding is ideal for a new industry, you know, new area, put the service in early and then get the funding long term to keep it running. But um, yeah, I'm going to have to handball you to bus planning. Sorry. Um, we've got time for one last question. And uh, John, you've been seated at the floor, so I'll bring you the microphone. Thanks, Jane. John Stone from Melbourne University. Just a question on depots and their relationship in space to the electricity supply. I know back, or it must be two years ago when we've been talking about this, there was a possibility of perhaps putting some depots or overnight charging near the railway stations on car parks. How is that problem of lining the depots up with the electricity supply coming? It's basically us working with DECA, Department of Environment, Energy, Climate Change, Climate Action. DECA and the DNSPs being the electricity providers, um, working out how far the depots are from their existing substations and what it's going to cost, bottom line, for us to get the right size extension cords to those um, transmission services. Uh, I'm still chipping away at the railway station you know, uh, parking lot idea, um, everything's really on the table, like nothing's off the table as far as we're concerned. There's existing depots which may not be suitable right now for, you know, ongoing zero emission bus operations, so they may well have to be decommissioned and we may have to look at some new depots. Um, yeah, there's a lot in that, yeah. Can I answer it? No, there's still a lot there. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's a lot of work there. As I said, the buses themselves are easy. There's good buses out there. There's great buses from overseas and local manufacturers. The buses aren't our concern. They can do everything we want them to do. It's actually the depot upgrades and charging them is the challenge. And there's some really good innovations too of companies who want to actually go to a depot site, provide battery storage, solar on the roof, but it's not going to charge a whole fleet of more than 20 buses. So even that's third part. But it could work really well in regional centres. So there's a whole raft of um, different ways we can approach depot upgrades is probably the best answer. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. A lot of questions from our audience and great...